Okay, we are live. Um, I want to welcome our stage for Hangout participants and anyone who is watching on Google and YouTube right now. Um, I am Samantha, the Editor-in-Chief of Stage Door Dish. I'm very excited to introduce Stage Door Dish's newest feature, uh, which we are taking part in today, called Stage Door Hangouts. Uh, the idea came to me as I was brainstorming ways and ways in which I could continue the site's mission, which has always been to bridge the gap between performers and their fans. Um, I've always taken fan questions, but I wanted to go beyond a step and let the fans ask the questions directly. Um, I'm equally excited to introduce our lovely guest today, Sierra Renee. Uh, Sierra made her Broadway debut in the musical Big Fish as The Witch, which, side note, if you, if you have not listened to that cast recording, go do so right now. I was totally obsessed with that musical when it came out. Totally obsessed with it. Um, she went on to replace Bettina Miller as a leading player in Pippin. Her most recent stage role was as Meralda in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, which was such a beautiful, beautiful show. And many of you know her as Kendra or Hawk Girl from the CW series Legends of Tomorrow and the Flash. Uh, she's actually currently working on her first musical titled Anything But Love, which will premiere at Time Science 54 Below. So thank you all for chatting with us. And Sierra, thank you for your time. And I will let us dive right in. Uh, Casey will be asking the first question. Um, yeah, hi, Sierra. I'm Casey. I'm such a huge fan of yours. I'm so excited to be talking to you right now. Um, yeah, as Sam mentioned, I mean, on top of all of the insanely amazing work that you're doing, you managed to find time to write a musical. Like, are you kidding me? Um, can you <laughs> just talk a little bit about Anything But Love now that you're about, like, a month out, I think, from its world premiere? Oh, my God. Um, whew, the pressure, a month out. <laughs> um, yeah, actually... This was this is a collaboration between uh, me and my good friend Ariana Taxman and her friend Arielle O'Keefe. Um, they had went to school together, and Arielle has been uh, working on becoming a singer songwriter. And she had written like a lot of like kind of old half tunes that weren't you know really anything. And uh, Ariana had went through and listened to a lot of them and was like, oh wow, these actually could be something. These could kind of like become this storyline. So what we came up with um, for the storyline, what we've been doing is reworking all the songs and, and kind of completing them and making them longer um, and fit in within our, our storyline of uh, three women, Lola, uh, Jordan, and Melanie. Um, Lola is like a high school, like 17 years old, um, and still kind of has that like Hopeless, romantic, uh, fairy tale, my prince is gonna come type attitude, um, and so she's you know obviously looking for like the one, the perfect soulmate that's going to complete her. Um, and then we have Jordan, who is an undergrad, and she's like undeclared, barely goes to class, um, you know, parties every night, goes out and gets drunk, and you know, kind of hops around from guy to guy to guy, and doesn't commit or look for anything serious. Um, and then we have Melanie, who is a graduate at Columbia, and she is basically a workaholic, career-focused, a little bit selfish, and she's doing her own thing, and is excited to be single, and um, is kind of pushing away um, a guy who actually might be good for her. And so basically the story follows kind of these three women and how um, their ideas about love are actually very toxic, like how the Disney princess view of love, how a guy is going to come and sweep you off your feet and be the perfect thing is very toxic. How thinking that you can jump from bed to bed to bed to bed and still be totally okay is very toxic. And also that like all you need, like I think being a career woman is really awesome, and that's something that I do, but also, like, you shouldn't be um, blocking out the possibility that there could be someone out there who could be a partner for you. So, yeah, that's the musical. <laughs> it sounds amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Who's okay. next? So, Courtney, it's your turn. 
question for you is, um, what has been the most fun part of developing Anything But Love, and what do you find was is has been the most rewarding part of it so far? Um, well, I think what's been really great is, A, I got to make a new friend in Arielle O'Keefe, um, our composer and singer-songwriter. Um, just this morning, uh, the three of us got together and we were Skyping each other, and we were talking about how to rewrite a song so that it would be a bit more poignant. Um, we were writing the finale of Act One. And um, then after that, I sat with Ariana, and we just, we, we both sit down and we give ourselves like 15 to 20 minutes, and we say, okay, we're going to write this scene about this, and these are the things we have to cover, and this is who's in it. And then we both sit down and we write completely different things, but like, you know, covering the same um, material, and then we swap and read them, and then uh, I say, oh, I really like that, we should use that. And she's like, oh, I really like that, we should use that. And we kind of blend them together. So I think it's been really fun um, being able to collaborate in this way. Like it's, as an interior, I think you definitely get to give some opinions. But as the writer, like, <laughs> all of a sudden I've got so much more control. And I think it's really fun um, to just be able to really bounce ideas off and have them heard because um, they kind of have to be. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, Jessica, you're up next. Hi, Ciara. I'm a huge fan. Um, I'm from Bulawayo, Zimbabwe, in Africa. Um, I think that your Broadway... Uh, your thing on Broadway was absolutely incredible. Your voice is so beautiful. Um, the question I wanted to ask, <laughs> the question I wanted to ask was, if you had any advice for someone who wanted to pursue a career in acting. Um, okay, oh, it's always so hard because I feel like everyone's path in life, but also in acting, is so different. Um. The way that you enter in can be completely different. Um, when you start can be completely different. And you could be wildly successful if you don't start until you're 50. Or you could be wildly successful at 22. You know, you never know. Um, so I guess, like, the most general advice I can really give is that you have to kn This is a business where I feel like you have to be incredibly passionate about doing this. You have to be incredibly passionate about telling a story. You have to be incredibly passionate about curating who you are and what you're trying what image you're trying to present to people um, and then the third thing is you have to be really passionate about business people don't think about it as a business and I think depend you know once you kind of get to a higher echelon and you you're like Johnny Deb and you just kind of like just do and say whatever you want and people let you do that um, <laughs> it may it might be different this is just speaking from my point of view and especially as a woman and I feel like a woman um, of color you have to know the business you have to know where you fit you have to know where you're going to break out you have to know um, how to do your taxes you have to know I mean like really like just the business of it um, like I just bought like a $900 camera so that I can film myself for auditions and stuff like that so that's like an investment that I had to make but it's like even do, knowing to do something like that and to invest in something like that is a part of the business and how do I make that work for me financially and not, you know. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I would say you have to know that this is so, 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 so important to you, that telling a story is important to you and also make sure you know the business, which is there are so many books and so many seminars about it and I'm actually going to start teaching classes about it myself. Um, so I'll let you guys know when that happens. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Kirsten. All right, hi, uh, I'm Kirsten. I am spending the summer in Ohio, but I am normally at school in Manhattan, actually. Um, and I saw you on Pippin, and I think you're wonderful. <laughs> so uh, it's great It's great to chat with you. Um, my question is, how did you get involved with the Hamilton mixtape? 
and what is it like being part of like the early stages of something that's gotten so huge? Um, okay, so when did that happen? Um, oh, it was right after Big Fish. Um, I'd actually just gotten my gallbladder out, and I came back for like the last two weeks of Big Fish, and I started auditioning right away, <laughs> which I shouldn't have done because I was like two weeks after a surgery. Um, but luckily I did because then as soon as we uh, got back in January, they were doing uh, like kind of the first big workshop really of Hamilton. And um, I went in and they, I think they had first called me in, uh, well they wanted me to do the rap for, um, remind me of the big sister's name, Renee's part. Angelica. Angelica, yeah. yeah. Um, and I butchered the rap. I was like, and I did, but okay, I don't know how to, I'm not a rapper. Um, <laughs> um, and then they were like, actually, like, can you do the, the, the mistress, the Mariah Reynolds? And so I came back in and did that. And I remember just being so like, oh my God, Lynn, you're so amazing. Like you did in the Heights. I love you. And he was like, chill. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, he's cool. He's cool. Um, and then I got cast, and we did the first workshop, and I just died when I heard the music. When I like finally got to hear everybody doing it, it was just. And I remember walking up to him like that day, and I was like, "BT Dubs, like you know, this is going to sweep all of the Tony Awards when it finally makes it to Broadway. Like you're aware, right?" And he's like, "Oh no, you know, being modest." And I was like, "No, like actually, I've never felt so confident about something in my life." And he was like. Cool. And I was like, cool. <laughs> so that was super fun. Um, and then I ended up doing the lab version later on, and that was kind of bonkers for me because I was doing Pippin while doing that, and that was like, you know, eight or nine hours during the day, and then working out, and then going to Pippin at night. <laughs> so it was a little like ah, crazy. Um, but it was amazing, and even then, I was, I still, I just told him, I was like, look, thank you for letting me be a part of this, because I know it's going to be freaking fabulous, and it's, I mean, I think that's one of the beautiful things about being an actor, is that you do get to invest time in things that will potentially become really amazing works of art. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. And Lindsay, you are up. Hi, Sierra. Hi. I'm a really big fan of you on social media and also in, um, I first saw you at Tris McCarroll's concert at 54 Below and you were so amazing in it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and um, I'm so sad I missed you in your shows, but um, my question for you is what was your favorite part being Esmeralda in Hunchback or what's your like, what do you like about the character. Oh man, that's so it's so hard to pick a favorite for that role because I really really love Esmeralda. She's I feel like of all the Disney princesses besides probably Pocahontas, like she's like my absolute favorite. Cuz I love the ones that are earthy and real and kind of gritty. Um and I think that's what I really was drawn to about Esmeralda. She's not the damsel in distress. She's not um kind of me can quite much a loud mouth like me. Um, she's and she's very passionate and compassionate. Um, uh, and I also think that you know she's kind of fighting the battle of do we have free will or is life kind of predestined for us? And you know if if we don't if if everything's going to happen the way that it's supposed to happen, then do we still try to fight? Do we still try to be good? Do we still try to you know what I mean? And I think. What's beautiful about her is that she does still have this hope that even if she has to die, even if horrible things do have to happen in life, that it's still worth it to try to be your best you and be a good human and care about other people and try to make the world a better place. So, oh, I really, I really love that role and I miss it so dearly and I, I love that show and I love what it was saying. I feel like it is so relevant to what's happening in the world now and has always been happening, obviously, because that was written in forever ago. 
Um, <laughs> and somehow it's still incredibly relevant that, you know, no one is really an outsider. We are all human beings. We all want and need and feel the same exact things. Um, and we should all care about what our actions do for other people because that's important. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to pick a favorite thing, but I, I do yeah, love it. Thank her. you so much. Thank you. And Tiara, you are next. Um, at which point we will begin again with Casey and go through the same sequence. Cool. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is actually Tiara. Nice to Hello, meet you. Hello. Very close to mine. We're twins. <laughs> Yay. And, um, <laughs> Currently, I'm in Japan, but I'm actually from the United States. Cool. It's uh, 5 o'clock in the morning. Got two, two hours before work. Excited to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. For That's amazing. <laughs> and um, my question is, did you read any superhero comics before um, taking the hot girl role? Yeah. Um, I actually like didn't have a choice because Mark and Phil and everybody, they sent me like a giant stack of them um, with the omnibus for Hawk World and everything like I so I kind of devoured as much as I could um, I think there's still a lot of the new 52 that I haven't read but um, I read quite a lot and uh, it's been great going to the comic cons because people will give me like really awesome old copies of like the originals which has been really fun to read especially since Hawkman and Hawkgirl have had so many different origin stories and so many different kinds of relationships. Um, obviously, the one we were playing with was, like, where Kendra doesn't want to be with him. But I always, I think it's really awesome to see their relationship when they were together as Hawkman and Hawkwoman coming from Thanagar um, to Earth to be, like, the police force. Because they, on it, like, it's very progressive, I feel like, for that time period, like, in the... 40s and 50s, because they were so equal. Like, both of them. The woman was so, she totally was like, oh, this is what I'm good at, and this is what you're good at, and we're both going to do these things in sync, and it was like the perfect little team, and I loved it. Um, but yeah, long story short is, uh, I did, I read a lot of the comics, and I actually have a, a great love for the comics now in a way that I didn't before. Yay, thank you so much. Arigato gozaimashita. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, so I'm wondering, obviously you have originated some incredible roles and you've also stepped into these equally incredible iconic roles and I'm just wondering sort of maybe if you could talk about the differences and the different challenges and the different rewards of creating a role as well as stepping into, you know, an established role. Yeah, um, well it's interesting because when I first did Big Fish, I mean technically I would get credit for originating it, which I did my version of it, you know, but it, I, wasn't, I wasn't with it during the workshops and I wasn't with it during Chicago, that was Katie, um, and before that was a man, I don't remember the man's name, they did a, a, a I guess a cross-dressing version, I don't know if that's a PC way to say it, but it was, it was really cool. Um, and uh, so doing that was really difficult because I only had two weeks to learn everything that everyone else already knew. And I was like, okay, <laughs> which didn't give me a lot of uh, leeway to put my own stamp on it as much as I would have wanted to. Um, but I know, I mean, we went a very different direction than what what Katie did. But, you know, again, that was sort of like stepping in, but sort of like getting the chance to originate and, and start to understand what that process is in creating something from scratch. Um, and then... Uh, I would say stepping into Pippin, which was a full-fledged, you know, production, and there were lots of people around me who, uh, you know, it was also, it was, a, it was a bigger role, and therefore I affected a lot more people. Um, that was really interesting because it was so set, and I was lucky enough to work with Diane quite a lot to try and figure out where I could make it my own and change a couple things and we, we did get to do that and so I, I really appreciated that. Um, but like, yeah, when you step into something you have to be able to fit kind of what's been prescribed for the most part. I mean, what you can do is change the underlying intentions and change, you know, what your character wants but 
as much as like you can't really say, well, I'm going to walk over to that side of the stage and then walk over to that side of the stage because they're like, no, you're going to get hit by a circus man, so don't do that. <laughs> um, and then uh, with Esmeralda, I feel like I had so much fun finding her and creating who that was and getting to throw lines out there and be like, well, what if she said something like this? You know, and obviously we had very amazing, like an amazing book writer, um, Peter Purnell and uh, Stephen and Alan, everybody were helping with words and lyrics too. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that was probably the most fun and also the most frustrating um, because this is such a collaborative process and you have to really you know, give and take, and I had lots and lots of ideas, and I'm kind of always like that, and sometimes I have to learn to, like, like keep, keep a couple under my, my hat a little bit, <laughs> um, but no, I think, I think it's really fun to originate, and it's also very terrifying, because you, you know, it's something from scratch, you just kind of have to, like, piece together, and, you know, you never really feel like it's finished. Right. Absolutely, thank you so thank you. much. Um, what was the best experience in getting to work on Big Fish, and how do you feel now that it's being like produced regionally and locally? Is it nice to see the show's legacy kind of like living on beyond Broadway? Absolutely. Um, I I I really like. Uh, I've actually had quite a few people privately message me and be like, "This is a video of us doing your number" or something like that, which I think is mm -hmm. really fun. And I also love that there's actually been a lot of guys who have sent me their video of singing it, which I think is great. I think it's a versatile song. Um, no, I, I, I love that people get the opportunity to put on shows and to see shows that, you know, didn't get a very long life um, on Broadway, but that I think were really lovely mm -hmm. um, nonetheless. Um, what, about, what is my favorite, or my favorite part about Big Pink Fish? I mean, it was kind of, I remember having a moment um, before we had moved into the theater. I went to the theater for, like, an ice cream, like, social media promotional thing. And um, I remember walking backstage and walking into it. And I'd never been backstage at the theater, I don't think. Um, and so I went, I went in, and I stood on the stage... And I just kind of started crying. So I was like, oh, shit. Like, this is my stage. <laughs> I'm about to stand on this every night. Like, that was very cool. So, you know, it was a lot of firsts for me. And it was a bit of a whirlwind. And I learned a lot of things really quickly, what to do and what not to do. Um, so, yeah, it was a good experience. That's cool. Thank you. Um... I wanted to ask, how do you feel like you relate to Kendra's character the most? Like, what do you find the most in common with her in Legends of Tomorrow? Um, I feel like I started really relating to Kendra towards the end of the season. Um, and also when she was on Flash. Because it was interesting, I feel like she was a bit of a different human on Flash, which might have to do with the fact that it was written differently, or by different writers. Um, but I thought she was kind of funky and interesting um, on the Flash, especially. You definitely got we got to delve into that side a lot. I think when she was on Legends, we didn't get to see that nearly as much because there was just a lot happening all the time. Um, but it was a bit of a struggle with Kendra because I feel like I have always felt like I know what direction I'm going in in my life, and to not know and to be kind of like. I don't know what I want to do, I don't know what my purpose is, I don't know whatever, is like a very interesting dilemma that I think a lot of people have, but not something that I feel like I struggle with too much. Um, I mean, definitely I have my moments of that in life, but I've also, I've, I've been going on a, a specific path for so long, so like it was kind of hard. Um, I, I guess I would say something that, just, I would think towards the end when she was really starting to come into her own and, like, find her own strength, that was, and she was becoming really defiant, that was kind of something that I really um, saw eye to eye with her with. And then the other thing is 
um, just I feel like she tries to stay hopeful as much as she can, even with all the horrible things that are happening. She just kind of like keeps on trucking, which is that's something that I feel like I do. Um, even when shit hits the fan, it's like, well, let's just keep going because something good's gonna come of this, or we're gonna learn a really good lesson later. Right now, it sucks. <laughs> um, so I think that's what we have in common. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, um, so I feel like this is probably a question that actors who do both theater and like TV and film get a lot, but I think it's interesting to see how the answers differ. Um, what are the different like benefits and drawbacks of doing like TV versus theater and vice versa? And is there something that like makes you prefer one over the other? Hmm. Um, I think I would say I love performing live. Um, I, I came from a singer background. I was trying to become a recording artist for a long time. Um, well, not a long time, but a, a while in high school. Um, and so I was always singing on stage, and then I started doing theater, which was just kind of like a further extension of that. Um, I really, there's, obviously there's the instant gratification of like people clapping, so you like feel that, but there's also like the silence of people and the, like the energy of people that you can feel when you're telling a story that means something to them. And then it's also really awesome that like afterwards you get to like speak to them at a stage door and they get to ask you questions and they get to say this meant this to me and to hear like everybody's take on it is really, really fascinating. And I feel like one of the main reasons why I do what I do is to tell stories that mean and mean something and matter to people. It's not just I like to be up on stage because I do. I do like to be up on stage, but um, you know, it's it's really about feeling and connecting with other people. So when you're doing TV um, and film, it's a bit of a different thing because there's no instant gratification, especially when you're doing a series like uh, Legends. You film most of it before you you know even air so <laughs> you're doing all this stuff and you're like I don't know if people are gonna like this I don't know if this is even working we'll see you know and um, then it finally gets out there and then it's nice that I think that's why I'm so big on uh, Twitter and things like that is because I like to hear what people are saying good or bad you know and then I can kind of just filter what I need to filter but um, it's nice it's really nice to be able to hear what people feel about it. So I think that's kind of why I'm drawn more to the stage. I like I like to know that I'm making an impact and it's harder to do that with TV and film. I also it's so weird, but and I, you know, I guess it's just like a it's a technical like skillful thing that I have to learn. But anytime a camera gets in my face, I'm all of a sudden like terrified of it. Like I don't know what it is, and it's it was such a struggle through the whole show because a lot of times I I would see a can't like another camera come into play because there's sometimes you know two and three and four cameras, and this one will be like oh shit I looked at it I looked at it damn it you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it's it's just it's a weirder it's a bit of a weirder thing that I haven't lived in for as long so I definitely think I need to do some more of it before I make like a final decision but um. I would definitely say for me, stage is, is kind of what I love the most. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, my question is, what is kind of like your favorite Broadway shows? Like, what are the, um, some of the shows that you really like? Um, okay. I love Chicago. I saw it first as the movie version. And I think it's one of the best movie versions of a musical, hands down. I loved it. I love how, like, sleek and sexy it was and kind of dark. Um, so Chicago is one of my favorites. Um, I also, I'm going to be super lame and be like, I love Wicked and Rent. Because <laughs> I do. <laughs> I've played Mimi three times now. Um, so yeah, obviously that's, like, that's one of my faves. Um... But I'm trying to think. There's been a lot of really cool new theater. Like, I love Fun Home, um, mm -hmm. which is out on Broadway now, which I think is just, man, that was so, like, you just, I was 
speechless at the end of it and just kind of like staring and like didn't know what to do. Like I wanted to cry, but I couldn't, and that just was like. So I love when I will. I love when theater just you know kind of mind fucks you. You're like, wow, I don't even know what to do now. Um, <laughs> so that's a that's a really great one. Obviously, Hamilton is fantabulous. Um, just trying to think what else. There's always like a million. Oh, you know what's so good, and I don't think people are talking about it enough, is School of Rock. I saw it. I loved it. I, it was like, really was like a little rock concert, and like these kids are more talented than I ever was at 10 and 11. Like I was making mud pies, and they know how to like play concertos. <laughs> I was like so blown away, and it was so funny because um, my mom and I went around Christmas time, which is like super tourist time. Um, so tickets were, like, ridiculously expensive. But also, um, you know, you get kind of an audience that's not used to seeing theater all the time. And so I'm super comfortable, and I was, like, dancing in my seat, and, like, woo! Like, you know, really excited about it. <laughs> but everyone around me was, like, looking at me like I was crazy, and I was, like, I like it. Like, it's so fun. It was just so fun for me. Um, so I think people should go see that show. I'm just going to plug it, because why not? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, let's see. My next question, I guess, would be if you could have any superpower, what would it be and why? Yeah. Oh, man, I get this one a lot. And it's like, I feel like the three most powerful things you could have would be flight, um, the ability to read people's minds or some kind of telekinesis or like mind power or being able to be invisible because mm. if you're invisible you can like watch things and hear things that you wouldn't normally hear and you can also get away from things and hide in places and just not be seen have you ever just like had that feeling where you're like Maybe you're embarrassed or like you're just annoyed with human life and you're like, can I just go somewhere where I don't exist? And like being invisible, I feel like, is the closest you could do to not existing and still be alive. <laughs> um, and then like flying, I am obsessed with flying. I am obsessed with being up high. I love being on rooftops. It's probably why I love New York so much because I'm always on a rooftop and now it's summer, so it's perfect for that. Um, and I just think like, that's a great way to get away, because who else is flying? Nobody. So, <laughs> like, that's great. And then the thing about, like, reading people's minds that I think would be amazing but would also be, like, so awful is that, like, there's no filtering it. And it's, like, very interesting when you think about the way that your brain works or the way you perceive your brain to work. Like, it may seem orderly, but when you go and look at somebody else's stuff, you're going to be like, what in the world does that even mean? And why is he thinking about, like, banana pudding and also, like, I don't, just, like, random stuff, you know? Like, because things pop in our heads very quickly, quicker than we're even, like, aware of it. So if I'm reading their mind, am I just reading, like, the big thoughts? Am I reading, like, the weird subconscious level? Like, what am I, what am I getting to hear, you know? <laughs> I, I always wonder about that. Um, and do I really want to know? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so this is going to be the last um, batch of questions. Everybody is going to be able to ask one more, and then we're going to wrap up. Cool. Great. Um, okay, so then my last question, I guess. I mean, you are so diverse in the roles you play and the work that you do. I guess I'm just wondering, who are some people that you know are your role models that maybe they're, they have careers that you'd like to emulate? I always find this a very interesting question um, because in school my director would often ask that question and say you should have like one or two people that whose career you want to have um, and I I've always fought that question because in my head I don't think that I'm near enough like anybody else to like follow the same path and like I said I really believe that everyone's path is so different that like having any expectation that I'm going to um, you know follow Audrey McDonald's career and have 10 Tonys under my belt is just like 
you know, it could happen, obviously, but I don't know that, like, expecting or saying, like, well, that's the path I'm taking is going to help me in any way. Um, but I will say, like, obviously, Audrey's a woman I, I very much look up to and, and admire and respect, and I think that she's been um, very classy and intelligent the entire time, like, for her whole career, which is wonderful. Um, I really love Frances McDormand. Um, she's an English act actress, I think, and uh, she's been in, like, a lot of, like, really cute, fluffy things, but then she, on the other turn of it, she can do, like, really amazing dramatic stuff, and I feel like she's always elevating even the fluffy stuff to be something more meaningful. Um, and I think that that is so often an actor's job because <laughs> we, you know, sometimes stuff gets thrown at us and we're like, that is, it could be <laughs> not the greatest, <laughs> but we're going to make something of it, you know? Um, so I really look up to her for that. And um, uh, what is, uh, tell me her name. Uh, the the woman who wrote How to Get Away with Murder. Oh, Shonda. Shonda Rhimes. And also, I want to say Denai Gurira. Mm. Um, I just think they're strong and they're powerful and they are using their voices, which I think is something that a lot of women are taught not to do, is don't use your voice. Um, I, I had a realization a couple of months ago. I kept getting tension in my throat. And I, I just, like, was losing my voice for no reason, and I was wondering what that was and wondering what that was. And I don't know if people believe in chakras or whatever, but the fifth chakra is your throat chakra. And when that is blocked, it's because you're not able to communicate or you feel like you're not being heard or um, you can't communicate lovingly. And um, it's just it was so interesting that, like, I, I've had throat issues on and off throughout my life. And I looked back at them after having this realization, and I was like, wow, it always happened at times where I felt like my voice wasn't being heard. And I think that that's like something that's become so important to me that I create a space for my voice to be heard because I don't think a lot of the way that uh, this industry is designed, it is not designed to create that space for me, especially with the particular people who run it, which I think we all know who they are. Um, they're not me, <laughs> and I think that that needs to change. So, anyway, <laughs> what were we even talking about? <laughs> I love your answer. No, I love your answer. That was perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, you got to play Esmeralda opposite Michael Arden as Quasimodo. Yeah. And now Michael Arden is directing, and you're writing a musical. Did you guys ever get to discuss that on the like about wanting to work on the other side of the stage while you were doing Hunchback? Um, I think we probably did have some kind of conversation about that, um, just because you know obviously Spring Weekend was coming. But um, no, I don't know that that was. It wasn't really something in my head yet. I, I for a, a very long time. Um, believed that I could not write or wasn't a good writer or um, that just wasn't something that I had the talent for or whatever. Um, and so it didn't really kind of dawn on me until recently that I really was limiting myself and um, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> like, anyone can do whatever they want. I mean, we'll see if it's any good, but if I don't try, then how am I ever going to know? So... Um, yeah, when I was in Hunchback, I, I really wasn't at the point yet where I was really needing my stories to be out there. And now that I have reached that point, that's kind of why I've decided to start producing, writing, directing, all of the above. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Okay. Um, so what are like your coping me mechanisms when, or like how do you stay grounded when you're just like, oh my gosh, I literally can't human today. What do you do? Like, do you just like read a good book or what would you, what are your coping mechanisms? <laughs> <laughs> you like that. Um, I can't human today. <laughs> I'm going to use that. Um, um, you know, so I have a lot of the same coping mechanisms as everybody else, but I, I do try to keep them in check because there are lots and lots and lots of bad coping mechanisms, meaning ones that aren't productive or are counterintuitive to uh, being productive or, or helping you. Um, 
you know, I think a lot of people think of coping mechanisms as things that take away the pain. But I think what a coping mechanism really should be is something that's helping you deal with it to confront it right head on, which is something we don't want to do. I think I use social media a lot as um, as the coping mechanism because it's like, oh, I don't have to think. I can just kind of like go off and you know tweet about whatever and talk to whoever and look at you know funny pictures of cats. So I use that and I you know try to limit that. I also love food. Food is my true love. <laughs> Last night I ate ice cream. I'm lactose intolerant, so that's when I couldn't human, and I decided to eat ice cream. <laughs> that, and obviously that's not a good way of coping with things. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I, when I was doing Hunchback in La Jolla, I started doing hot yoga, which... I'm like a really, really hot-blooded person, so being hot is kind of like the worst thing in the world to me. I just feel like I'm going to pass out all the time. So I challenged myself to start doing hot yoga, and I actually now love it um, because it is, it's the kind of place where you can go and you're challenging yourself in a way that you can't think about other things until you, it comes into focus what you really should be thinking about. So I try to meditate and do yoga, and I know that that sounds all like kumbaya, happy, whatever, but like coming from someone who, you know, I deal with a lot of anxiety, I deal, I've had depression in the past, um, that is something that has helped me cope in a really positive way instead of eating my feelings or going on social media. <laughs> so I would say that, um, and also, yeah, I think reading, getting out of your own world for a while, but also taking in something that could be helpful is is a very positive way to cope, and I do like to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, okay, so I saw that you were in The Wild Party, which is one of my, like, favorite shows, um, and... I know it's like super it's such a dark show and I've always kind of wondered like what being in a really dark show like what kind of mental toll that has on actors so, yeah um yeah I mean honestly Pippin was a really dark show yeah yeah um and I I struggled a lot in that show it was a very isolating show um, and even though I feel like my cast, they wanted to hang out and everything like that, it just, I never really felt up to it, you know. I always felt like kind of being in my own shell because leading player is very, um, very much in her own world, you know. And she's creating a world outside of that, but she's doing it from her own one singular place. Um, so I think that did bleed over in, in, a, in a sense. Um, I love... This isn't my answer, but I, I loved during um, Big Fish, I talked to uh, Norbert, and he said that that was actually really dark for him because he, you know, he passed away every night, um, and he said that he would go home and, like, be with his kids and, like, eat ice cream. Like, he was like, I had to do that. No one could talk to me. I needed to eat ice cream. Um, and I think during Pippin, I spent a lot of nights going to Lucky Burger and, and eating my feelings a little bit. Um, but you know, it's I don't. It doesn't have to affect you that much. I I don't know. Sometimes I feel like I want to throw myself into it because we have this whole like romanticized idea about being like method and it like taking over your whole life or whatever but I think like that's pretty unhealthy and <laughs> so we try to like find the balance of like where am I human and where am I leading player and why are they bleeding together that much you know what I mean mm -hmm. um, but yeah I think it absolutely can take a toll and you kind of are unleashing all the thoughts every night that you're trying to keep at bay you know we all have not so great thoughts you know, when we're road raging or whatever. Why did that person step in front of me? How dare they? You know, I'm sure you have some some idea of what you're going to do. That you try to keep sequestered down. Um, but uh, when you do roles like that, you, you want to let that kind of stuff out. And that, yeah, that can be really exhausting. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. 
Um, my question is if you could be any B and Y. Uh, one second, hold on, two seconds. I think I'm going to lose yeah. my computer. Oh. Okay, sorry, I wasn't plugged in. <laughs> okay. It's okay. <laughs> Um, do you want me to repeat the question? Yeah, sorry, I missed it. Okay, it's okay. Um, I was going to ask if you could be any type of kind of animal, would you be and why? Oh, man. I feel like I want to be like, no. This is such a hard question. I'm so excited by it. Like, it would be really cool to, like, be a bird, right? But also, like, not that cool. Because, like, birds aren't soft or cute, really. Like, I mean, some of them are cute, but they're not really that soft. Like, I don't want to be, like, a fluffy thing. But then I'm thinking, like, fluffy things don't get to, like, swim in the ocean. Maybe I would be a dolphin. I think that would be great. Because they're also, like, fun, and everyone likes dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, hello, and uh, my question is, what countries have you traveled to? Oh, not that many. Oh. Um, it's okay, though. Like, um, growing up, we did not have the funds for that. We went to the beach, I think, twice. That was nice. Um, <laughs> but uh, now that I, you know, am my own human, I get to, like, go traveling with my friends, which is really great. Um, I've seen a lot of this country. I've road tripped it, which is great. Um, obviously, I've been to Canada. Um, I went to Tijuana, so I guess that counts as <laughs> going to Mexico. <laughs> um, I have been to Paris, France, and I have been to uh, a couple different parts of England. So, and I think that's, yeah, that's really it. I mean, I passed through some other ones, but that's all. Please visit Japan if you have time. <laughs> I would love to. One of my best friends worked there for a whole year at uh, Disney, um, and she's thinking of going back, so maybe I'll go with her. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today, and thank you especially to Sierra for taking the time to chat with everyone. Um, I hope everyone had a good time. And I think we are good. Uh, please, if you can, go see Sierra's show at 54 Below on June 26th. I'm sure it's going to be amazing. So again, thank you everyone, and thank you, Sierra. Thank you. Bye. Bye.